thing, you know, that oh, I forget. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there's, there's one thing um, to keep in mind, I think, about New Yorkers. One is that they're used to tourists, you know, there are so many oh, tourists that, okay. that come here that that's just the way it is. And oh. the other thing to keep in mind is that if you're in a touristy area, area uh -huh. you're likely to be seeing more tourists I than see actual what you're New Yorkers. Okay, that would make sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That makes um, a lot of sense, yeah. <laughs> That does. But, I can't uh, wait to get back there. I cannot wait. <laughs> yeah. Hey, ladies, how you doing? Hi, good to see you. You, you too. Yeah. So I don't know what our crew is gonna look like tonight, Gio. I forgot okay. to turn on the start the broadcast at six thirty because Nicole and I started talking. <laughs> 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 no. oh, that's okay. Well, yeah. I, know, I know Joel said he was coming. So oh, he did. Okay. He did say he was coming. Okay. So, so that <laughs> that may be the only other one, um, because Vanita, I don't know if she's coming or not. She has not answered my phone calls today, and I think she might have been working today. Oh, at, at her new job, and that what well, that is why she couldn't do the um, agenda for tonight. Oh, um, yeah. Okay. So she may be too tired anyway to come. Um, right. And mm -hmm. Kim, of course, mm -hmm. is not coming. So Joelle may let's give Joelle a couple more minutes. Okay, no problem. Okay. Yeah. So how are, you, how are you doing, Joel? Uh, Georgette. <laughs> Georgette is from Newark, right? Yeah. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah. Born and raised. <laughs> yeah, uh, New Jersey. Nicole was just telling you about her her visit to New York. And when? Oh. How long ago was that, Nicole? This was some years ago. My son was actually very small. Uh, so it had to be about, actually one of my best friends graduated, undergraduate. So yeah, this was a long time ago because she uh -huh. finished up undergrad. It must have been over 10 years ago. Okay. And um, her dad had gifted uh, the trip. And so, um, so yeah, wow. it was oh, that's so, nice. It was so like, you so you were talking about looking at New York through a feminist lens. What, what, what do you see when you look at it that way? Well, I wanted to go back, like, and pay attention to architecture. Um, you know, of course, just kind of people gazing. You know, I want to look at the people take it, and um, but mainly, I think I was kind of thinking more so about, you know, architecture interactions. Um, I can recall us going to Harlem, um, and that was, a, mm, it was an interesting, um, that was really an interesting experience going to Harlem. I guess because we were in Manhattan, and so, you know, I was kind of like uh, surrounded by more whites. Uh -huh. um, and then we went to Harlem at that time, because, of course, um, I, I know gentrification, but uh -huh. at that time I was like, you know, it's just I feel it was beautiful. For I don't, it's just uplifting. Like I'd always seen, I grew up watching the Apollo, yeah, and so yeah. to see it in person, and um, and then to go to Sylvia's and to just see this establishment that this, and I know that's probably like the stereotypical spots, <laughs> <laughs> like like when you're not up inside. Uh, but, you know, we went to all those, you know, touristy uh, spots, attractions. But, um, but yeah, I would like to just go back and then sit in that restaurant again and kind of just be permeated in just to sit and ponder as to what, what had she overcome and how many times had perhaps she wanted to give up and you know I'm just thinking about things kind of differently mm -hmm. um, 
And then um, uh, Broadway, we went to an off-Broadway, uh, some theater. My, 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 my best friend's father, um, he actually, he and his fiance, they do so much more than, than we did in terms of uh, seeing the city. But yeah, I, I just think mainly I was thinking more so about, I want to take in the architecture, the buildings again. I just want, I want to visit archives. I want to go back to the library. I, there's just so much that I didn't, you know, think about. Well, you're going to have to move here for a while to do all that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of stuff. That's a, uh, you know, uh -huh. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, for as many years, Nicole, as I have been in and around New York, it's really not until I moved here that I started getting a grasp of just how huge yes. this city is, physically, mm -hmm. land-wise, huge. Yes. Because, you know, Manhattan mm -hmm. is really pretty small. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> Other boroughs just go on and on. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you can get on a train in the, a subway in the Bronx, Yes. And be on there for about four hours to get to the opposite side of Brooklyn. Right, right. That's so true. <laughs> and the amount yeah. of stuff, when you talk about the amount of people, oh my God, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how to do it. I really don't. <laughs> you know, it's, crazy. it's funny because, um, you know, like with public uh, transportation here, we have what the city buses, Metro. And um, and so when you see somebody doing something like singing or you know it's just so out of the ordinary. <laughs> but, yeah. But I you know but friends in New York they're like oh girl I see that all the time it's you know I don't even I mean I don't know if that's yeah. just a stereotype of the artsy you know people no, I'm no. trying to. It's, it's, <laughs> it's true. It's true. Especially <laughs> especially in the subway system you know and what I. Just, what I just learned, um, not that long ago, maybe a couple of years ago, I realized that there is uh, some kind of program that, oh. that, that the MTA sponsors where musicians have to try out wow. a spot to perform in the oh. underground. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. That's, that's interesting. First, yeah. that would be inter, you know, involved in the musician's uh, career in yeah. that way. Yeah, I and didn't then you thrown yeah. down in the subway, sink or swim. Oh. How much did <laughs> you get? Oh, five dollars. You know, little hats. You know, you think yeah. they're just, you know, awesome. oh but so they really are, you know, professional musicians. Yes, yes. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's really cool. I'm yeah. glad you shared that tidbit of information. Yeah, you? yeah. And there's also an arts program. Like I know um, on 14th Street in particular, they have these like the cutest little statues all over the place. Huh. Like a, a musician. And so that was commissioned by MTA. And then, you know, there's a lot of art um, that's along the walls, you know, or built into the tile, you know. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. they, 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 I guess they try. Joelle! <laughs> hey, how you doing? How's everybody? Hey. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get the link. Uh, Georgia just sent me the link. Um, okay, well... I don't, um, uh, I guess you don't remember that I said the only place I'm going to post the link is in the session oh, fit, yeah. fit group okay. yeah, that's right. on Facebook. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I started doing that because, you know, remember we were having problems. You all were sitting in one hangout and I was someplace else. And, oh, okay. Um, yeah. So yeah. I, I tried to... to, to yeah, plus, 
Georgette didn't send it to me. It was her fault anyway. <laughs> My uh, fault. Uh, <laughs> well, okay. If I had been a good friend, I guess I would have done it. Okay. And here you have it. <laughs> the limits and everything else. <laughs> That's what we're learning if we didn't know it already. Yeah. Well. <laughs> well. Well, she, she's responsible for me having a master's and a bachelor's, and two bachelors. Oh, wow. <laughs> I am sure that's right. We can't go on because Nicole has a doctorate level agenda for us to get through. <laughs> Man, I, I, I looked at that, I was like, what the hell? Last time, I didn't get as many questions. You know. Oh, okay. You turned you 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 shortened it, but it's still intense. It's concentrated. Okay, I'm doing better. Yeah, yeah. That's right. I just get so excited. You know, when we have, when you have the opportunity to uh, know thyself, to learn about your, it's just like, wow, I just get excited. I and my know. children, they say, they say, Mommy, today is Tuesday. We can't come into your office right <laughs> now. This is my favorite time. You know? <laughs> that is so and They know they have to stay out of my office while we're on the hangout. So, yeah, so I just get excited, y'all. I'm just, I can't. All I can say it. That's all right. Well, they, they can stop buying me this sometimes. <laughs> we I'm, down, here. I'm down here in Charleston. I'm having a storm and a half outside, boy. I mean, it is. Oh, oh, really? Holy, oh, my God. I'm in my office, but Jesus. All right. Wow. The Lord covered in the blood, covered in the blood. <laughs> <laughs> All right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Nicole, you want to take it away? Okay, yes. Um, so uh, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are the Global Black Feminist Reading Circle, um, and we're going to start the scheduled meeting. Reading Circle, June 28th, uh, 2016. Um, reading Paula Giddings' When and Where I Enter, The Impact of Black Women on Race and Sex in America. Uh, so let's start by um, introducing everyone. Um, Michelle, would you start us off? Hello, everyone. I am Michelle Odom. I'm in Brooklyn, New York. Welcome. All right. Um, Gio, would you go next, please? Georgette? Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm Georgette Moses, and I am joining you guys from Columbia, South Carolina. Happy to be here. And Joel? I am Joel Jones um, from Charleston, South Carolina. Well, really from North Carolina, but I'm here in Charleston, <laughs> South Carolina. You know, I came back here back in the early 2000s, but anyway, we'll go ahead. <laughs> I was ready for that history lesson. I'm telling you, I wanted to hear. We are definitely talk. Okay, and I'm Nicole Jackson Wilson from um, Houston, Texas, and just happy to to be here. Um, okay, so next week we are doing the um, the, the format that we discussed. So no moderator, and then the timekeeper will be Joel. Um, just a word to the community rules: don't mute the mic and be sensitive to sound. Uh, again, tonight we're focused on when and where I enter, and chapter 16, uh, to be specific, SNCC coming full circle. Uh, we'll have Find the Black Feminism and then close with reading our story together. Okay, so I'll just start with the um, summary, and then we'll go into the discussion questions. Um, so uh, one would be remiss to not recognize the potent intertextuality between Chapter 16 of Giddings' When and Where I Enter and additional insightful literary masterpieces recognized as part and parcel of the black American literary canon. This would include, to name a few, 
great works of literature by Frederick Douglass and Pauline Hopkins and Claude McKay, Langston Hughes, Gwendolyn Brooks, and even June Jordan. Um, moreover, it's evidenced in Giddings' ability to narrate by providing historical context the complexity of black womanhood without ascribing to tropes or more specifically mythicizing the black woman's strength. Um, Giddings, in fact, manages to echo the brilliance and vulnerability in Zora Neale, Zora Neale Hurston's um, character's uh, sentiments, Janie's grandmother, who says the, well, I chose the word black, but she says the black woman is the mule of the world. Um, she goes on to trace and describe the rhetorical significance of shifting political discourse related to black women's mind and body. What causes the reader to fixate on her words most is that she critiques Cartesian dualism or the Cartesian split. As Giddings appears to argue that during the turbulent 60s, the black woman's mind is with her body. In other words, as long as her body is contained and controlled by Jim Crow laws, she is, and rightfully so, mentally preoccupied with freeing the body. Therefore, the mind and the body are similarly situated. This significantly explains why it's important to, unlike other media, not reduce the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, to a footnote in the larger discussion of black enfranchisement. Hence, by pulling SNCC and by extension black women's leadership roles in SNCC from the margins to the center, Giddings aptly locates and narrates the black woman's sense of urgency in the pursuit of freedom and her right to self-actualize. Um, okay, so we'll start with the key points. What, um, where I was kind of going was I was thinking about black arts, poetry, literature, and kind of saw these links um, between the text and these other authors. And so that's nice how I um, organize this. So, uh, so what happens to a dream deferred, Langston Hughes? Um, Georgia, do you mind reading um, A for us, please? And the um, well, there's a lot of questions, but <laughs> that's okay. Uh, sure, I don't mind. Okay. Okay. All right. A. At the beginning of chapter 16, Giddings explains the deliberate collapsing of hierarchy in SNCC. Giddings states. Whoever took it upon themselves to do something generally did it. Both the structural nature and the goals of SNCC propelled women into the forefront of the struggle in a way that was not possible in more hierarchical male-led organizations. Question 1. Please explain the significance of Giddings' description of black women's leadership in the organization. Also, please evaluate and compare Giddings' descriptions of the organization to mass media representation of the organization. Consider movies about the civil rights movement. In using this, number two, in using the central theme, Deferred Dreams, in Langston Hughes' poem Harlem, as a metaphor for the primary argument in chapter 16. Please contemplate and explain the relevance of Gidding's observation. Most of the young women in SNCC had female doers as role models. At the least, their mothers worked and were usually capable of coping with any situation that could affect their children's lives. And, and like many of the young activists, Davis was influenced by a strong-willed grandmother who made a point of talking about slavery so that her grandchildren did not forget about that. And question three, in further considering the construction of grandmothers in the text and Giddings' desire to pay homage to black grandmothers, please critique the author's decision to include Angela Davis's complex and multi-layered tribute to her grandmother. She had always been a symbol of strength, age, wisdom, and suffering. I also wish to encourage self-to-text connections here in paying homage to our grandmothers, emphasis added. What do you remember most about your grandmother? And how do you ensure that the narrative, your memory, lives on? Okay. okay. <laughs> um, anybody, any, either one of those? I, um, I would take the one on the grandmother. Okay. Uh, my my grandmother, of course, you know, um, my grandmother 
uh, Dorothy Jones, and uh, her nickname was Cake. Okay. <laughs> um, my grandfather, uh, is, my family is originally from Greenville, South Carolina. My grandfather was a great brick mason in um, Greenville, South Carolina. He, from all accounts, he was one of the main architects, and he, the brick mason, he just about built the whole city. Uh, back in the day, uh, my grandmother and mother and them, they were considered a middle class family. However, my grandfather was very abusive. He drank a lot. So my grandmother, back in the 20s, I think uh, he had, she had went to Hamlet, North Carolina just one time. So she got on the on the train one day in the um, um, uh, early uh, late 40s and 50s or thereabout and she took her kids and she asked the people what's the far she could go. So she went to Hamlet, North Carolina. At that particular time it was a great seaboard, uh, seaboard uh, railroad it was the main railroad and it was the main junction. And she left with nothing in her in her pockets. Mm -hmm. She took all her kids and um, all of, I can just remember um, we lived in this place called the bottom which was the worst part of the small village that we lived in and then we moved to a, what would be it's a big gray house, it was a shack, it was huge and so all the families lived there. I remember distinctly uh, I was um, I had went to segregated schools until about it's about three years and then at that particular time there was a lot of things going on such as <clears throat> such as low-income housing mm -hmm. you know projects they were building you know what we call Newtown mm -hmm. in Hamlet North Carolina and um, my grandmother I remember saying there you know her name was Dorothy Jones she said well, ain't nobody in this house and my grandmother only had like a fifth or sixth grade education mm -hmm. ain't nobody in this house going to no new town we ain't going to any projects nobody she mm -hmm. said only thing they want you to do they want to control how much money you've got your, 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 if you have any children your daddies can't come over there they can't live with you we ain't doing anything like that so mm -hmm. at that particular time I always tell people that my time is up permission uh -huh. Well, would you would you like two more minutes? <laughs> yes, yes. Permission, yes, permission. Um, okay. And uh, so, at that particular time, which and, and so Newtown, uh, a lot of my friends they lived, and and uh, integration was a two-edged sword. I saw it for myself, and I lived it. I remember in Hamlet, North Carolina, uh, East Hamlet, we had our own grocery stores, we had our own financial mm -hmm. everything, we had our own school, they closed our school down, they sent us, you know, about a mile away to the other schools, I mean, they, I mean, everything, it was just, it tore the neighborhood up, and, and then they took, and then people went to Newtown, and, and so, long story short, all of my grandmother's children, every single one of them and her all just about all her grandchildren all of us became uh, uh, all of by us going and taking that uh, uh, stand there and moving from shack to shack working our way up and working our way out all mm -hmm. of us became homeowners every last one of us mm -hmm. became uh, the second generation uh, Began, we got, you know, uh, uh, degrees, a lot of us. But the thing that I remember is all of my friends that went to the projects, a lot of them are still there. Mm -hmm. a, lot of their, a lot of their children and grandchildren are still in low-income housing. Mm -hmm. But I remember, and my grandmother never did own a home. You know, we moved her out into with us. You know, when we built homes and stuff out there. You know, she we, she had a a nice uh, a nice trailer and everything, but she lived on the property. But she saw all her girls, all her men, and all her boys and her family own property. So that's what I meant. But just by that simple thing that she refused that any of us would go and move into uh, 
uh, low income. Not because it was because of the mindset. It wasn't anything wrong with it, but at her, to her, it was the mindset, and that, and that to me, that uh, that was the that was. I remember that was a, that was a strong woman that believed that. And you know, when we look at things like the movie, like The Help, my mother had to walk out of The Help, you know, because she mm -hmm. was a domestic worker early before she went, and my grandmother was a domestic worker and stuff like this here. So that's what I remember about my grandmother. Wow, that was beautiful, Joelle. Wow. <laughs> mm. yeah. Anyone else? Wow. Um, I guess uh, on on question one, I would say I, when you when you talk about women's leadership, are you Nicole talking about the way she described SNCC as leaderless mm -hmm. and non-hierarchical? Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I I. I guess for me, I wouldn't necessarily call that women's leadership, uh -huh. but you know, but a particular um, management style. Mm, that makes um, sense. And and one that I advocate. Mm -hmm. um, but it it, but I think the in terms of your question about. Um, Comparing it to mass to mass media, I don't know. I you know really, I I did that list of movies today, and I'm struck by how many movies I have not seen. <laughs> <laughs> so so now I'm gonna be on a on a movie watching binge, I suppose. Um, but but I think just generally. speaking, Speaking and um, I I would say the significance of the description of the leadership style of SNCC um, is one to make us conscious that there are multiple leadership styles mm -hmm. and that the hierarchical model is one that is most promoted uh, and I would argue seen in mass media um, in a patriarchal culture. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you've got daddy on top and he's the boss and he tells everybody below what to do and, you know, if he's got to knock some heads to get his job done, <laughs> then, mm -hmm. you know, then, then that's how high, hierarchical organizations function. Um, and so, so the significance of SNCC adopting a more open uh, approach to leadership that um, where, you know, where essentially all of the members were free to take on tasks um, and get the work done allowed them to get so much more done. Mm -hmm than was happening prior to that. Um, it also you know, started to raise questions about, uh, like with Gloria Richardson, questions mm -hmm. about the, um, the efficacy you know, of the nonviolent strategy. Right. Um, so I think so I think the significance is that style is what opened up um, the actions that were the potential for the action that occurred in the early 60s to occur. That was only one question. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like more time Michelle? <laughs> um Ms. Moderator? Yeah, well, I'll just say quickly that um, I did think it was a very significant point that um, Angela Davis's mother, you know, made a point of talking about slavery so that her grandchildren wouldn't forget, um, and that, that we're not so blessed. 
in terms of grandmothers, you know, my family is very broken, and I guess in a sense it goes back a long way. Some of it is just because of the way that I grew up as a PK, and so we were always separate from grandparents and the small amount of, of family that were in other places. So I didn't know, both of my grandfathers were deceased by the time I was born. My grandmothers lived miles and miles away, so I didn't get to know them well. And my mother was rather tight-lipped. But she did talk about the fact that her mother was married three times. So she went trucking with no man. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> she was one strike and you're out, huh? Okay. I did that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, no, that's right. High five. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, I I just wanted to add that um hmm. Well, I, ne I didn't get a chance to know my grandmother. She died when my mom was born, but I hear she was a pistol. <laughs> okay. So you were the shot one. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, I'm trying to trying to keep it down, trying to moderate that. Um, I have no bail money. I have no bail money. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh. And and so and like your mom, Michelle, my mother did would not talk about the past. It would mm -hmm. just you know, really hard, you know, you had to be listening really close to catch the things, the mm -hmm. trauma that had occurred as she grew up in the South and then the same you know, even I would uh, say mm -hmm. similar worse bad experiences in the north in New Jersey. And so, you know, for a long time, we didn't understand why she was so violent, <laughs> okay, <laughs> and it, I guess imbalanced, <laughs> I'm like, and racist, <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, prejudice, okay, she was prejudiced, okay, <laughs> and sometimes prejudice against her own people, but because of the trauma, and then reading material like this book and others mm -hmm. really has opened my eyes in a way to help to relook at you know the things that I discovered about her life growing up mm -hmm. and through a different lens, more of understanding and not oh mama's just crazy, okay? <laughs> Maybe we came <laughs> from crazy folks. But that it, you know you can really be traumatized to such an extent. Mm -hmm. And and then you know you have to really be amazed at how these men and women survived and came through as intact as they are, shaky though it be, you know, to this point. And so, no, she didn't talk about the things that happened, but she did instill a couple of things in, in, in us so to keep us that strong. And to link that to the question about um, mass media, and in particular movies, and the current one that's series that's out called Underground, which is I discovered I had passed it by, but I'm going to get look at it again. Is the young generation wanted to take a new look at slavery and not see it as being you know the oh we're just gonna you know wait for somebody to save us you know that kind of thing, but ha but visualize it as all these different pockets of rebellion and how that mm -hmm. would look, and I think it's a very fresh look at the history and I'm, I'm happy to see it and no we don't talk enough about it because we're told to shut up and nobody wants to hear about that anymore this is a new day but hey we are still in prison and there's a there's a, um, a line in here where one of the women who um, went to prison and she was pregnant they put her in jail and she said well it does they want to bail her out and she said no don't bail me out because I'm my baby's going in Mississippi, I believe it was Mississippi, my baby's going to be born in prison wherever they're born here in Mississippi. And I think it's kind of that feeling again, you know, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. We need to wake up. We need to open our eyes. The prison is everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm under time. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm under time. No, I'm good. I'm good. We can move on. <laughs> um, 
good. So yeah, I agree. Wow, those are beautiful. Oh wow, I I love hearing about everybody's um, grandmothers in particular. Um, I I guess what struck me was kind of just reading how Angela Davis described her grandmother. And then going back and rereading those words and reading them, you know, but what the one word um, um, is when she added, because, of course, the other words had kind of positive connotation, strength, age, with, but then that suffering at the end. And I just, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just that blew me away. Uh, she, you know, to be a symbol, what does it mean to be a symbol of suffering? But, but then I, in reality, I know that has been the black woman's um, experience. Um, I'm just blown away. I was floored by that. And so it made me start thinking about the narratives. And one thing that I, I started pondering after watching Roots, after re-traumatizing myself, <laughs> um, is that what narratives are we telling? What's my family's narrative? How are these stories going to live on? What am I passing down to my children? How do we work within those gaps, the, 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 the silence, right? Because um, unfortunately, culturally and racially, uh, as, a, as a result of the, the, the racial trauma and racialized violence, right? Um, their silences. So I thinking about my grandmothers and I did have to like capitalize the grand because in hindsight, I do see them as grand women. Um, they're both deceased now. My, my father's mother, um, Mama, we called her Mama, <laughs> yeah. Mother Pruitt, um, she just, I mean, a loving woman. Um, she's very religious was going to praise the Lord and give you an amen, a hallelujah in the middle of the street. <laughs> a sermon could go with it. <laughs> and at her funeral, you know, people stood and said, you know, Mother Pruitt told me to read Psalms 23, and she told me Psalms 32 and 37, and it was just, her life just spoke. She, I, I felt so much love. Um, she would always sing, yes, Jesus loves me to us. I mean, very, very poor very poor, impoverished, but just radiated love. And um, and she would tell me, she would say, you know, we are going to turn things around in our family. And she said, and you know that, and baby, the Lord is going to set the captives free. And she would say that to me. And she said that we were all going to, you know, have great education. She said, you all are, uh, we, we are smart people. I didn't understand when I was younger. She was um, very fair-skinned. And she would tell, I, I heard her at times saying like, you know, and because I'm high yellow that other women were jealous of her. But, but after coming into, again, a critical consciousness and understanding how colorism and Eurocentric beauty standards operate. Oh, two more minutes. <laughs> Do you want more time as moderator? Yes, please. Yes, please. Um, but yeah, so that gave that gives me additional things when I think about her and when I'm writing about her uh, and passing on stories to my children. I'm I'm negotiating um, those things. And then my mother's mother, my mother's uh, being very matriarchal, no boys. My grandmother had was well, alleged she had some male twins, but they passed. Um, but five girls, and um, and I'm just talking about. And I hate to reify the the strong black woman trope, but I, she was very, very strong. She worked. She had nice things um, and would cuss you out. <laughs> <laughs> she could cuss like a sailor. <laughs> so I come, you know, this very religious grandmother, and then this other grandmother who would say, praise the Lord and cuss you out. <laughs> um, but... But in healthcare, oh. and um, she would call herself a nurse, and it took me, you know, I got into school to realize she was actually a nurse's aide. Um, and now I think about, like, how her dignity must have been on the line at times. You know, she was older, had been doing that work for years and years and years and didn't have the degree. And I just wonder now, did she, what situations might she have faced that put her dignity on the line. What 
how did she negotiate her identity in those um, in the hospitals? Um, you know, and the doctor she fix food and so forth. But I'm just I'm grateful that in in in, in retrospect, I'm grateful that. Uh, I did come from these women, and and I and I know myself. Pieces of me, you know, are embedded in in are those pieces of those women embedded in me, and you know, passing it on. So, so anyway, Angela Davis's quote just had me, it had me thinking about that. Yeah, uh, Joelle, could we um, maybe give ourselves five minutes? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Since we are down three people. <laughs> okay. Did you hear the word Randy has left us, Joel? Yeah, I um I um um email Randy and everything. Um um sad. Yep. Yeah. Very yeah. sad. So um but Nicole, I did wanna pick up for a minute on, on what you're saying about the word suffering mm -hmm. and, and the trope of the strong woman. Mm -hmm. um, what, one, thing, one thing is that black people, um, you know, really have been yes. <laughs> strong at a, a an astounding level, yeah. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, Absolutely. you know, and any other Lee we can <laughs> come up with, <laughs> we 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 really have. And so, um, to me, it's not it's not just it's not that it's a trope. It's that how do we learn to be more tender with ourselves mm -hmm. because having to be so strong to survive. I mean, you right. know, I, I'm quite sure you couldn't sit around in slavery talking about being tender with yourself. Right, right. Absolutely. You know, but to the extent that we have a little bit of, mm -hmm. of breathing space, then how, as a strength, how mm -hmm. do we engage better self-care yeah. um, because we've been strong but it's not that it was easy or without a cost. Right. The other thing is suffering suffering to me is is a part of what that strength looks mm -hmm. like because we were able to be long suffering mm -hmm. could find the courage to go into some of these very risky violent um, situations mm -hmm. to strike a blow for freedom That's right. So, so, so to me, suffering is a strength. And like in one of your other questions, um, you use the word docile to describe MLK. Mm -hmm. And and I would, <laughs> and and you know, and I think that that comes out of Paula Gidding's description of how he was one of the people that wanted the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party to accept the second compromise. Mm -hmm. uh, offered by the Johnson administration. He, along with many other people in the black bourgeoisie. Um, but I always wonder when I'm encountering someone in, in your age group, <laughs> yeah. you know, how the narrative Changing. has been transmitted. Yeah. yeah. Like I remember uh, when reading. Um, Ta-Nehisi Coates' book, Between the World ah, and Me. Yeah, I love it. And, <laughs> yeah, but he kept saying, you know, I just don't understand those people subjecting themselves to all of that violence. Were they insane? But I just want to scream, but if they hadn't done it, 
Right. Where would you yeah. be, right? Where would we be? That's so true. Um, so how I is mean, it that we can get 30, 40, 50 years out yeah. and then not yeah. honor that courage? Yeah. And, and it was because we don't tell the story. The story is not being told. You, you, I, excuse me, Michelle. Oh, go ahead. I, I, I really believe that um, um, when you look at people uh, that's in the past and what they went through and the bodies that had to be stacked for us to stand on, you know, like you said, we don't honor that. We, we say, well, I wouldn't. I mean, think about this. This is what I always, when I go back to the civil rights movement, when the main strategy of the NAACP and other organizations was to send out children as buffers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the movement, right. to send them out and be and, and let dogs be turned on them and water and things like that. And children, I read this one thing. Uh, I don't know where I read it at, but that it is. Anywhere you look in, hist in the history of the world, there is no revolution unless it starts with the youth. Mm -hmm. None. No revolution. All revolution starts with the youth. And I think that's where we're at in this society uh, right now. Uh, as far as young people is concerned, you're seeing them step up more and more and more and more. I believe that the, the children from the 70s after the civil rights movement until this generation right now, we mm -hmm. have been the ones that have been the real lax. I mean, we have, it was just, we were just terrible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, truly, truly, but you're right. But when you go back to the 60s, yeah. <laughs> you know, the yeah. they, they got to get their props. That's mm -hmm. true. I think, too, um, like what the... So the conversation regarding, um, yeah, the rhetoric. So when I speak of the, like, not wanting to fully embrace the strong, you know, the trope of the Amazonian slash strong black woman, is because when we go back and look at um, the 14th Amendment, that in many ways, you know, just to, to just ascribe this um, supernatural strength, if you will, to black women, it's really our government's way of not doing its job. Oh, they'll survive it. <laughs> oh, she mm -hmm. got over it. Oh, my grandmother came through, which, which they did, but mm -hmm. they should not have. Mm -hmm. They should not have had to endure that. And we, st we should not still be enduring these crises that we find ourselves in due to racialized and racialized gender violence because our government has treated us like second-class citizens. And I'm reading some gender theory in which the theorist is saying that really it's a way to organize um, to organize us in these groups. And so you go from human essentially to subhuman and then non-human, you know? So it is so interesting how, yeah, that the discussion has shifted in terms of why is there, has there been a historical expectation for black women to be strong, to appear strong, to stay strong? You're strong. You can do it. I had, I was uh, teaching um, in one of my last stints teaching high school, and I had a principal say that to me. <laughs> like, but you know, you, you know, you black women, y'all don't, they don't, she was talking to me about the Latino students not really respecting black w women in general, not just black women. But then she said, but you know, you black women, y'all are strong. You'll put your hand on your hip and do your neck roll. And, I, was like, and I almost gave her that neck roll. Like, <laughs> 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 So, but you know, so I think that's really, uh, Michelle, just to, like, just this notion that our government is failing us and our government continues to fail us. And when we are ensconced in this trope of the strong black woman, it, it allows people to not see the pain, the mm -hmm, suffering, mm -hmm. the Absolutely. reality that white womanhood is always protected. You look at that alligator story and Different so, but white womanhood is always it seems to be protected, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. like um, 
But, you know, Sojourner Truth asks, and, and, and ain't I a woman? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Um, so I think that's where, you know, we're kind of getting it. Um, I don't want to call Dr. King docile. I'm, what I'm saying here, though, is there's a public consumption of docility. It's like there's a, there's a, a, a stake. There's a reason why people want to see him as docile. Why can't, and people will still use that rhetoric. Why can't you you all be like Dr. King? He wouldn't, all that protesting and burning your neighborhoods. Like when I'm reading after like Ferguson and so forth, you know, (laughs) people were asking that, like, is this what Dr. King would have wanted? The question is, what's your stake in the consumption of a docile Dr. King, because if you really, you know, doing the research, you know that he was becoming more militant (laughs) by the end of his life, right? So Mm -hmm. it's just like, why is there a stake in white people Mm -hmm. seeing him as, oh, he just wanted peace. He just wanted us to integrate. He wanted a lot of things, but Mm -hmm. you all like to fall back on simply that. So, um, so yeah, but I agree. I agree. We, we. Well, Jesse Williams is gonna shake him up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you, Anne. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, let's let let's move forward because okay. you have so much richness here. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, so for B, I was thinking about uh, Gwendolyn Brooks and still kind of looking at the dream, dream deferred. And then I love kitchenette building, and I love how it starts. And then when she, oh, my Lord, I love that woman. And um, she says, um, we are things of dry hours and the involuntary plan, grade in and grade dream makes a giddy sound, not strong like rent, feeding a wife, satisfying a man. And so anyway, just kind of leading into uh, the second portion of the text. So, um, Michelle, are you, <laughs> would you sure. I, I don't know. Okay. Does she, the, uh... Does the poem below it? No, that doesn't go with it. My name is Abraham. Yeah, that, that goes-, goes with C, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, B. Further in the text, it is evident that Giddings intentionally deliberates and unveils how black women sought to expose, contend with, and ultimately decenter legacies of paternalism and patriarchy. It is interesting that as a result of her descriptions of violence against black women's bodies, not only does Giddings make a bold statement about state-sponsored tactics to shatter the mind of and delegitimize the body of black women who met tumultuous consequences simply because they, as BET honoree and actor actor, Jesse Williams, so eloquently stated, acted so free. But she also purposefully engages those troublesome yet magnetizing tropes that are so strongly associated with black womanhood, the mammy, the Amazonian woman, strong black woman, and the Jezebel. Question four. While I would love to discuss how tropes function in the text, in order to get through the full discussion, please consider the function of the strong black woman trope in the text. How does Giddings use the stories of black women activists like uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, Diane Nash, Ruby Doris Smith, Catherine Burke, Angela Davis, Bertha Gober, Gloria Richardson, and others to negotiate that trope How does Giddings use the stories of black women activists to negotiate that trope and the desire for the existence of the strong black woman trope? What does this reveal about black women or the narratives of black women at the helm of mass struggle? I defer. (laughs) Yeah. I should have proof did a little bit more proofreading. <laughs> no, no, it's fine, it's fine. Um, like my students love to point out. <laughs> you 
are you? <laughs> glad y'all are not like them because they're like you. <laughs> what did you mean? <laughs> but um, no, no, no. Go ahead. Let me think about what I want to say. Hmm. Well, I'm just going to jump right in with two feet. Maybe two left <laughs> feet. We'll see in a minute. <laughs> Well, the, what I keep seeing over and over from all of these women is that who's going to do it if I don't do it? I've already seen how these guys have mishandled this and how it's time to put some skin in this game because I've got children that are looking at me and I need to show them what it will take to get what we all want and need, which is freedom. And so if I have to die, if I'm getting bombed out of my house and burned out, if I've lost my job, you know, if I'm in prison, I'm in, I've been jailed, and the, the jailer is beating me because they want me to say, yes, sir, <laughs> you know, I have to prove not only to my children but to myself that this, this goal to get this freedom is more important than anything else. Because if I buckle, then everything buckles behind me. Who will help my children get what I so desperately wanted, what my parents so desperately wanted, and those people before them? So being willing to make that sacrifice, I mean, if it meant uh, doing, doing whatever, it, whatever it took. Like the one instance where the woman who was taking in uh, the SNCC students, she was going to get arrested for taking them. But she got up that morning, she fixed breakfast for her family and for the students, and then she turned herself in. Mm -hmm. She did her part. You know, they're willing to do their part, whatever that was. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if that took being the Amazonian, the Jezebel, the <laughs> maybe some of them had, you know, like, maybe they're going to get stopped and they had to, like, mammy up. <laughs> You know, yeah. to, to the authority. <laughs> well, what you doing now, Miss Susie? Well, you know, yeah, blah blah blah. We're just trying to go with you know, and I know your mother. I don't, don't I know your mother? And then they might have used that, you know, as a tactic to get done what needed to be done. You use all the tools at your disposal when you're at war. You know what? What weapon? Kick a cop in the groin. Okay. <laughs> Grab hey. the club out his hand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You use what you have to, by any means necessary. So it was interpreted in different ways, in different instances. So they did what they had to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what? What you were saying about showing children. Um, you know, I don't. I don't know if it's just some really. You all saw the, the video that I posted, um, was it today or yesterday, about why women need a tribe? Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I don't know if you, you went to the end of the article where there's another video uh, of a TED Talk with um, Lily Tomlin and Jane Fonda mm. and, and one of their other friends, uh, but talking about that same subject. And so one of the things that Jane Fonda said was one of the differences is that that women don't have to prove their masculinity. Huh. We're not weighed down by those burdens. <laughs> you, know? Okay. you know. And so in this context, you know, I guess I want to say that it's like um you know, maybe maybe men, you know, trying to live out that image of the provider, the protector, you know, the pressure hmm. of that role. Um, while they're doing all of that, they're missing something about how real change, how real growth happens that that women as the traditional nurturers learn by virtue of raising a child you mm -hmm. know and you, you see them you know last week I was talking about well now we're on the scene you know 
when she started talking <laughs> about the early 60s, like, you know, I was born December 1959. Mm -hmm. So while all of this is happening in the, the first half of the 60s, you know, I'm running around in diapers. My biggest concern is how to get out of kindergarten. <laughs> right. right. But we have entered Georgia. <laughs> right. And I had no idea. <laughs> we had no idea all this was going on. But when mothers, you know, get to see up close, you know, I, I think it's different now that more men are involved in parenting, but the mm -hmm. traditional mm -hmm. paradigm where that was the mother's role, get to see up close the developmental process mm -hmm. and so you don't just go from zero to 60 you know like that but there there are these steps and these stages um, and so and so I think that that is some of why the women needed to kind of take charge of, mm -hmm. of the movement because the men were off on some other, some other thing. You don't know what they're thinking about. Well, I think, uh, if I which may... Is, which is not to devalue what they're thinking about, which is why I start with the protector-provider role, but it's different from the nurturing role. Yeah. I'm done, Joelle. I believe that, um, and you're, you're right, um, I think you yeah, it, it I always think of I always think of where people are at at a particular time in the movement you know whether it be the early 1900s or the 60s or whatever because I think you have to look at everything holistically where women were at period you know uh, black women and white women uh, you know certain rights that they were given had women entered into the workforce what type of jobs was available and uh, what type of privileges and and how things you know were because I look at a lot of things like this here you know how much time do a man have to be involved in nurturing versus if he's working slave labor at 15 to 16 hours of a day <laughs> you know right. he, he, he might he might want to go and toss a little Leroy at the ball but Lord have mercy the only thing he can think about is getting ready to get up at four o'clock in the morning and mm -hmm. go out there and get it again you know six days a week so I always look at things like that but if I could go back to the point of Dr. King you know a lot of people times people like to think about Dr. King being you know docile I don't think he was really docile but he was playing two ends of the spectrum he had he had a couple of presidents that he had to really push along and you know respectability himself uh, I remember one time and uh, I y'all familiar with uh, Bernard Rustin the civil rights, civil rights leader Bernard Rustin the gay civil rights leader Bayard. Yeah, Bayard yeah, Rustin. Well, you know, I remember he told Dr. King to put down the weapons because he wanted to arm himself, you know, and and, uh, and he's like, how's it going to look if you're going up there and you're arming yourself and this is supposed to be a peaceful movement and whatnot? And uh, and he, you know, and, uh, and he... He told him to put them down, or that would seriously injure the the movement in itself. And and of course, you know, black folk in the '60s, you know, um, Mr. Rustin, he had, you know, he, I read about him. I didn't. It's a shame I didn't learn about this man until I was like 50. Mm. You know, because he was gay. You know, mm -hmm. he started the Southern Christian Le Leadership Conference. You know, and, and um, going back to your point again, you know, y'all have so much stuff going out there. Um, uh, with the uh, 14th Amendment, you know, you're talking about the 14th Amendment. People don't know how uh, Donald Trump and the Republicans now are, you know, they're trying to injure the 14th Amendment. If he, if he, if, you know what I mean? If he, get a, if he gets away with what he want to get away with, our citizenship in itself would be in jeopardy as black folk, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. yeah, these are some trying times. Ooh. Yeah, okay, yeah. I'm done. <laughs> I agree. <laughs>
Um, I think like um, looking at those uh, tropes, I I could see like white America's stake in um, those tropes, and then recognizing how black women had to negotiate those tropes. So the trope of the strong black woman. And then when I read like, oh, oh my gosh, I love Fannie Lou Hamer. Oh. <laughs> and so um, when I read Fannie Lou Hamer and, and, and I'll read those word, uh, getting the words that Giddings wrote and she's saying, you know, yeah, I got it. Yes, I have a right to be angry, you know, and, and so the trope of the angry black woman. Um, or, you know, what's sometimes known as like the sapphire trope. But um, I was trying to kind of like shift my gaze and see like, then, then I know, I understand white America's investment. And then I understand that black women really had to negotiate those representations. But I was wondering in the context of the black family, then was there, how did that trope operate? Like I, like, I get how it operated, but just, nego I guess the better term is negotiating it. Um, when I'm not in Miss Ann's kitchen, or, you know, um, I'm just wondering, like, because I grew up, I was just trying to, you know, I'm trying to make these connections because I grew up knowing that I had, like, a very strong, my, my maternal, grandmother, very strong, Helena Bennett, very strong woman, do it yourself, you know, uh, you don't wait around on a man to do anything, you get up and work, you get there early, you work later, you know, and that work ethic, and so, so, well, so one, one of the things, at home, though, Nicole, that, that does come out in this text is, is early on, it's about the the easy the model of seeing your parents changing gender roles. Mm -hmm. You know right. that, that a lot of the children of the bourgeoisie had that image, had that model. I had that model. Okay. Do you think? And see, and that's the other thing. So when you're looking at the uh, the you know that black bourgeois, and then when you look at the rural black. I was, I guess, I was thinking more about them, who could have represented more lower class. Do y'all think that's what kind of what Giddings was kind of describing, um, the rural blacks as, uh, in terms of social class, uh, not necessarily uh, middle class. Did you all get that? I mean, I know there were some yeah. who had money who were stable middle class before the most part. Um, yeah. That, uh, well, I mean, in the in the in the depictions of, I, I, I can't say that I got it, you know, like you got it, but I think in the depictions of these northern black youth, mm -hmm. middle class college student black youth and white liberal youth mm -hmm. um, penetrating the deep south. Uh, where, where the people were living in such terror. To, to me, it wasn't, I didn't get the, the description of the class meeting oh, okay. as, as much as the violence, the, 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 the different level of violence mm -hmm. that was going on in the deep south. Oh, that that's that's mm -hmm. deep, Michelle. Yeah. Wow. Wow. You just blew me away. Yeah. Wow. Um, that's true. Yeah. It was like an order, a southern order of violence. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. Thank you. Woo. That was deep. Yeah. That was deep. <laughs> but you know, but. But in terms of class, I guess I would say also that you know I didn't really I didn't really pick that up that she was was drawing a picture of the Southerners as as a lower class because you know you had all of these mamas who opened up their homes mm -hmm. to the SNCC workers 
you had, you know, Fred Shuttlesworth who who rescued, you know, the women that got dropped off by Bull Connor at the train station. Right. Um, you know, you 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 seem to have homeowners, mm -hmm. you know, with some means um, to to support that whole process, hmm. and who were and who who you know were fearless. Not fearless, but fearless, yeah. you know, about what the consequences were, were going to be. And they knew there were going to be consequences. Mm. And, you know, and, and, and um, Michelle, uh, that is uh, so true because all in the South you had uh, pockets of, of uh, neighborhoods and townships that mm -hmm. had their own financial stability that people had fine homes you know what I mean they had fine opportunities I mean even in um, we just read it, um, even in Columbia South Carolina you know in Columbia South Carolina and all over the south you had these people that had a lot of money and hey just like when uh, a few weeks ago when you had uh, persons that uh, they're talking about you know what happened down into um, what happened in Orlando is a mass shooting, and you, if you look at all the mass uh, terrorist acts that has against African Americans mm -hmm. during the 20th centuries, they went and turned, they went and burned down told whole townships because they were doing well. You know, all through the South, in Florida, Oklahoma, Texas, everywhere. You know, and going back to a point, you know, I, it it really disturbs me when you see. Uh, you know everything that that goes on in this country, but yet they want us to shut up about what happened to us. Because mm -hmm. when, you, when we're talking about these grandmothers, and you're talking about uh, Nicole, you're talking about your grandmother. I know uh, that you know that that she was a nurse's aide, and I know Georgette's mother person. I met her many many years ago this woman had a PhD plus anybody can teach themselves how to read Hebrew <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean but it gets down to one word and one word only opportunity right denied <laughs> you know and so we still have to talk about what happened and respectability of these women and what they were not able to achieve because they did not have the opportunity and then the opportunity denied for a whole race of people for hundreds of years. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ooh, y'all are deep tonight. I'll tell that's you all point. the time. Y'all yeah. <laughs> are deep. <laughs> yeah, because sense. when you when you think about the opportunity denied, uh -huh. um, then also you know, like you were you were questioning. You know, was her dignity ever on the line? Mm -hmm. But if you know that the opportunity has been denied you, then is there another space in you where mm. you don't need the validation right. of the system that is denying you the opportunity? Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Hmm. That's a lot of sense. Yeah, did um, I couldn't shake that that voice in the text. Uh, oh, you know what? I'm I'm probably thinking of I don't know. I kind of read the other chapter as well. So was it chapter 16 where the white woman says she starts referring to herself as bad? No, that was with Fannie Lou Hamer, and she says, "Well, she's good," and then she talks about kind of like that theory of looking glass, uh, sociological theory, looking glass self. That um, Fannie Lou Hamer, she was saying it's like what had been projected onto her. That might be chapter seventeen. I don't okay, remember. Okay, I was that. probably ahead. Okay, okay. So I'll I'll save that. But yeah, that that blew me away too. I'm All just the problems wondering. of being an A plus student, right? <laughs> <laughs> No, it's like when you get some black women study, you know, and you like, you just want to gobble it up. Like, oh, I've been waiting on this all my life. Um, okay, so then, okay, so I'm going to, we'll move on to um, okay. to um, the final one. So this is from June Jordan's uh, poem, just an excerpt from June Jordan's poem, Kissing God Goodbye. 
And so she said, my name is not Abraham. My name is not Moses, Leviticus, Solomon, Cain, or Abel. My name is not Matthew, Luke, Saul, or Paul. My name is not Adam. My name is female. My name is freedom. He cannot say my name without shame. He cannot say my name, my name. My name is the name of the one who loves, and he has no dominion over me, and his hate has no dominion over me. I am she who will be free. And so um, so when I was reading the final part of the text, I started thinking about how black women were grappling with um, that double-edged sword of paternalism and patriarchy and what it must have been like. And then so, you know, because the black church is kind of always undergirding these discussions. Um, and ten minutes. So, got ten minutes left, people. Ten minutes. Oh, ten okay. Minutes. And so I was just thinking about um, where they must have started thinking about the role of religion here and um, in patriarchy when we start thinking about Christianity. Um, so, so I just so let's go to just kind of like just one of these and we can close out and just kind of looking at uh, number five, I think. I just wanted to know where do you all stand regarding um, unity? I've heard different arguments. Some people say it's facetious for us to think we're coming from different walks of life, different class backgrounds and so forth. And some people say it's kind of facetious to kind of promote this idea of a whole, a myth, it's mythologizing it, the black unity. Um, and then others, so yeah, I just wanted to know where do you all stand? And I'll just read the question. Where do you stand regarding the tension rooted in the arguments about black unity? Is the very notion of black unity a myth? Is it possible to agitate for equal rights without cultural or racial unity? Can black women support black men while also agreeing that black liberation requires egalitarian engagement from both black men and women? And then what of Southern and even Northern uh, paternalism? So just kind of, you know, just just wanted to know where do you all stand in, in terms of the discussion regarding that? Okay. I'm a, can I, is it fair to say that we need about two minutes of peace on this? Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I'm done now. That's fair. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Who's first? Uh... I, I I don't know. I was just saying today in one of my Facebook discussions that um, that I really think we 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 were talking about ownership was the issue, but I was saying that I think it, 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 we we really I don't know. I think we're really sort of on in in this individualistic and fear laden culture that we occupy that we have really kind of all are all moving on our own path, sort of in the decentralized anybody can do what they want to do way um, that that she's using to describe SNCC without necessarily doing it in a conscious way and maybe that is a good thing because you know in chapter 14 she takes us back to the scene of the crime of where materialism um, became such a factor in this chapter chapter 16 she takes us to this to the scene of the crime where the fear the hopelessness the loss of faith mm -hmm. Uh, became such a factor. So while we were trying to get out of kindergarten, Joelle and, and George, <laughs> you know, our people were already starting to question the value and efficacy of collective action. Mm -hmm. So the reason, so when you talk about our generation, you know, being just deadheads, this is the scene of the crime. <laughs> Mm -hmm. of where it started and we haven't even got into the hopelessness that was resultant from the black power movement and COINTELPRO right. and all of that kind of thing so that by the time we came of age <laughs> nobody wanted to be bothered with nothing mm -hmm. 
So, so I, 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 I don't know if it's a myth, if unity is a myth or not, but I don't think it's what we have right now. Mm. Mm. Oh, very good, Michelle. Okay. <laughs> was, it, was it two minutes? <laughs> yeah. All right, go ahead. After all that hemming and hawing I did to try to get started, right? <laughs> okay, who's next? It's okay. Oh. Oh. Well. All right, we're <laughs> okay, I'll jump in. Well, wow, that terminology, black unity. Yes, I'm looking, and I'm like, well, where is it? <laughs> okay, <laughs> where is it? Because, and then I have to go back to this last, um, these uh, last couple of lines in the chapter where they're talking, where she says, for despite legal rights, in the end we learn that there are a thousand ways for people who are weaker than the rest to be kept in their place. Hmm. And there were those who believed that the incipient women's movement was one of those ways. Now that was like, bam, right there. Okay, wait a minute. <laughs> so I have to say that, when I, and my, my older brothers, my brother and sister are 11 and 13 years older than me. And so they were involved in a black youth organization and all that, you know, Black power movement and dashikis and learning kung fu, you know, really heavily when I was growing up. So that's what I saw, and you know, in African Afrocentric schools, you know, kindergarten springing up, and then suddenly, what happened to the communities? Hmm. Drugs, crime, um, this, and all types of disenfranchisement, because those were the weapons that were very effective against people trying to come together and achieve something for a, an entire group. And one of the other things that I saw in here a little earlier when they were talking about how SNCC sort of devolved because more white people were involved in the movement. Mm. Now how could that turn into a bad thing? You would think more people on your side believing in you and your cause would be good, but instead somehow that turned into a bad thing. You know, it evolved into some kind of race sex thing and you know, and, and perhaps people who probably felt, well why aren't more black people taking charge of this? You know, it's our fight. You know, you can help me, but don't don't become a be get in a leadership position over me, you know. Fight beside me, not above me, you know, kind of thing. Maybe that was it. But, um, well, shoot, I don't even know where black unity is today because we're so scattered. Well, it, and part of it is that history. We don't know the history. You know, we don't know these important names and what they went through. And the people who do know it, well, we kind of have, we pull out some folks who are like very extreme and they want to kill and bomb up people and nobody wants to be on that list. Okay. <laughs> You don't want to be on that list because now you're a terrorist. So, so, but it's all right to know, and I don't think we've come to the, the part where we can educate everybody, not just black children, but white children and, and indigenous children, everyone about their history, to acknowledge the pain and the trauma that's occurred so it won't reoccur and then find a way to move past it and make these laws that are on the books more effective. You know, first you have to know the laws on the books, okay, and how, what it says, and how it, it would empower you if you knew something about it. And then take, your, and then take yourself to the poll and vote. Uh, I think, like, who was it, Fannie Lou Hamer said, so I can vote them out because they're not in my best interest, <laughs> okay? <laughs> you know, simple, simple things like that we've been distracted from educating yourself about your history and everyone else's history so you know where you stand and then and then your powers you know your legal powers uh, uh, you know and start on the local level who are these people that right now are voting about my school okay are, are voting about what resources I can use in my community who are these people that are in charge of allocating the funds very quickly, Joel. Georgia, you know what you're saying about the the impact of the white students coming into SNCC. 
Um, I think with, with that whole scenario and with the outcome of the Mississippi Freedom De Democratic Party, that there seems to me to be a lot of parallel there to the Bernie Sanders campaign and this current presidential cycle. So I'll leave you all to ponder on that. <laughs> um, okay, um, if I may, right quick. I think, uh, well, first of all, until we get rid of Columbus Day in 1492, we're not going to know the truth about any damn thing. But okay. um, uh, when we talk about whether, you know, whether or not uh, everyone had the right to be equal, I think that you put that in the front. You know, you, you have to have that as a utopian type, you know, equal rights and, and things like that, because that's what I think you want to strive for, you know, as a, you know, as a society and as a people. I mean, that's part of the whole package of being a full citizen of this country, you know. Um, and uh, I Are think you saying we shouldn't expect equal rights for real, for real? No, I said, no, I said we should. No, I'm, that's quite the opposite. I think that that's what we should strive for, you know, as a society. You know, that's what we should do, you know. And uh, I don't think it's a it's a myth. I think that's part of the the American dream and the package, you know, in mm -hmm. itself. Um, I think where we missed the boat uh, many many years ago when we got the legal when we got some of the legal rights, you know, we automatically thought that we was going to jump up and be you know, be the president of the bank instead of that, you know, instead of, you know, instead of thinking we're going to be a bank teller, we should have thought about if we was a janitor to get a contract to clean the bank instead of working for the bank. You know what I mean? The entrepreneurship part of that. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, I believe that, um, um, I believe that if there's such thing as a black unity, I think that we're at a place where, you know, we can't, I think we've been pigeonholed so long that you're going to have those type of people. You're going to have some people that are going to be a part of the unity situation. You know, it's just like saying, walking up to a black person and say, oh, you're a Democrat or mm -hmm. you're a Republican. You know, I mean, you know, you're white, you know, you, you can't be a Republican. You're, you know, and think everybody's going to vote for Hillary or they don't have, you know, we are many people. You know, we're we're many people. You know, we are good. We are bad. You know, we be, some of us believe in the black thing. Some of us don't believe in the black thing. Some of us are selfish. Some of us not. So I think I think there's room in the tent for all of us as a people. We're more complicated than what they think that we are, and we should be more complicated than in the cause we are you know we are gifted beautiful people and we got I mean I, 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 I sometimes you hear me talk about I do family reunions and stuff like this here when I really get down to it the family reunions and the weddings and our stuff the black family is very strong you know it's very strong it's not as weak as they want us to know how weak we are you know as you know and so I think we're all of those things and above you know I think if you know, it's not a B C or D I think it's E <laughs> yeah, you know, all mm -hmm. the above. Thank you. Cole, last word. <laughs> well, um, I, I certainly still question um, the reality of black unity. I think there are some things that, you know, if you're black, we're universally, and I'm, and I'm speaking throughout the diaspora, this transcends borders that there are just some things that we experience that, you know, other people don't necessarily experience. But I don't, I'm not ready to, to um, confidently state that there's a so-called thing as like a black unity. Uh, I do think when I read like older civil rights texts um, and the talk of the beloved community, and, and so, and I'm and I'm grateful that that there are communities within this, um, you know, are the people who, black people, we share, uh, you know, skin color. That's universal, some universal issues. So, um, but unity per se, I'm just not confident. But I am grateful that there's, you know, that you can find a beloved community in. And I just hope that our people, wherever they are, whatever the need is, 
has found a community that you know they could feel a part of and, and love on people and be loved on, assist and be assisted. Um, because it's a cold, it's a cold world if you're going it alone. It's it's a cruel world <laughs> to go it alone. So with that being said, I want to thank you all again. I love you all. You are just you just don't know. I look forward to Tuesdays. <laughs> <laughs> I learn something from you all all the time, and you just ah, oh, you all just make you make my days. You make you make my life so much better. So thank you all, and uh, just a wonderful discussion. And wow, I'm learning so much. Can't can't wait until I get the next book. I I just say to myself, man, I wish I would have known about this. <laughs> Reading circle six months ago, seven months ago. So yeah, so thank you all. Well, the love is mutual. And actually, I, I was thinking today. You know, we've read. Um, you know, we've we, we've read about feminism. You know, before it was called feminism, we've gone back to the 1800s, and we've been in the 1900s. But we really haven't read anything kind of Alice Walker's book, but that was, you know, that was, that I can't count that. Uh, we read um, We Are the Ones We've Been Waiting For. Mm -hmm. What I was thinking today, it would be good maybe for our next book to read something on this third, what is it, third wave feminism or something that brings us into this century. Um, I think Paula Giddings is going to stop us in the 1970s, so maybe if we found something that, you know, kind of covered the last 50 years or some piece of it, that would be a good direction to go. So, you know, maybe if we can all start thinking about some, some suggestions along that line, that would be good. Thank you, Nicole. As always, you are lifting us higher. <laughs> okay. Good night, Georgia. Good night. Hey, um, I think Vanita didn't come because she's scared of cat. <laughs> oh. It's all right. There's nothing but love here. Everybody <laughs> learns something. Yeah. 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 Right. Anyway. If you're not, you know. She started a new job, so she's probably just tired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love it's you, Vanita. Okay. <laughs> How long have y'all been best friends, Michelle? Huh? How long have you and Benita been best friends? Since we were about 12. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> I love Benita That's so straight up. <laughs> <laughs> So also, yeah. yes, yes. also, Joelle Kim is out for the remainder of this session as she, you know, uh, focuses on getting her daughter off to college. So okay. that's where we are. Okay. Have a great Bye. week, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.